All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, back with Josh and Paul, and uh, David and Deirdre are here uh, as well. Uh, just wanted to, A, give you a quick update on where we are on COVID, then talk about some of our um, reopening strategy when it comes to outdoor um, events and cycles. First of all, um, the summary is um, the trends are all continuing in the same right path. Um, 360,000 tests performed. That's close to 10% of our total population. Worth remembering, many people have been tested twice, so we're really a little under 10% in terms of our totals. Uh, deaths are at single digits, tragically, but way down from where we were before, and hospitalizations continues down. I think this next uh, chart will show you a little bit about hospitalizations, Max. Um, what you see there um, is two things. You see the red line shows you where our peak was. Our peak in terms of hospitalizations, about 2,000, was on April 22nd. We're down about 90% in terms of hospitalizations since then. The yellow line you see on May 20th is interesting. That's when we did our phase of reopening for outdoor dining and stores and the such. And the good news there is uh, I don't think we opened too early and the trend lines um, in terms of hospitalizations have continued down. And that allows us to do our next phase of reopening tomorrow. This next map is um, fascinating. It's put together by the uh, COVID uh, exit strategy group. And um, what you see is in red are those states that are, quote, trending poorly. Trending poorly is reflected in terms of increasing hospitalizations, increasing positivity, percentage of those who tested and tested positive. Uh, and uh, sadly, it's a reminder that the number of states here who are uh, trending poorly is up compared to one week, three weeks, and five weeks ago. Uh, mainly a lot of states, we talked about Arizona the other day, Texas, Florida, California is really in and around LA. These are the hot spots that we focus on like a laser beam, doing everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen here. Uh, making progress, I think you can understand what those uh, are about, but trending better is what I really wanted you to be able to see. Um, that's again, it's Connecticut, uh, thankfully, as well as New York and New Jersey. Uh, over there, Illinois, and um, that means, A, our positivity stays below at about 2%, which is extraordinarily good, even a little less the positivity rate in New York, which is extraordinarily good, and it's good news for us. That's one reason we can feel more confident about opening up uh, restaurants and the such, even though some people from New York may be coming up, they don't have a high infection rate, they have a low infection rate now going forward. So um, testing, we're still in the top 10 overall per capita in terms of testing, a way to go, but I think that's another uh, reason we're in the green, one of the positive states trending in the right direction. And of course, our hospitalizations continue down as well. And finally, this next chart, it's a little complicated, but it's the rate of transmission. And uh, what that says is, um, if you're infected, how many people are you likely to infect? And that means that if you're below one, obviously the footprint for COVID is shrinking because for every person infected, you're not infecting another person. If you're on the red side of that graph, um, that's not a place that you want to be. Um, New York and New Jersey, if anybody has, this is an eye test, by the way, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, that blue arrow, you can see have the lowest um, transmission rates in the country. And uh, we were just thinking about what does that mean? Maybe it's because um, we, we got hit with COVID earlier. But then we looked over, we saw Washington State, WA is there in the red, for example. You know, that was hit even before us. Um, I'm not going to overanalyze this, but I am going to tell you these are the type of metrics that we think about very carefully when we talk about reopening, how fast we can reopen, and uh, the fact that New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are more likely to be wearing the masks than some other parts of the country is making a big difference. Finally, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, reopening um, starting tomorrow again. I think you know, um, and David has given you a good uh, detail in terms of what we're doing in terms of indoor dining since outdoor dining has worked pretty successfully over the last uh, four weeks. 
hotels. I said before, we feel more confident even people from out of state coming in now, certainly from our region, which has a low positivity rate, low infection rate. Um, the personal services, uh, we've done the, the hair, now we're doing the nails, now we're doing tattoos. Uh, David, you'll be happy about that. So uh, we're getting some uh, progress here in terms of um, a lot of what we're doing to get 95% of our economy um, up and operating. Outdoor, people ask me about a lot. And what are your protocols there? Why do we have rules about outdoor? I see thousands of people protesting, and yet I can't have a graduation or I can't have a big outdoor barbecue in my backyard. Um, what's going on and what's your rationale? So starting tomorrow, first of all, for um, our personal space, our private gatherings, you can have up to 25 people indoors and up to 100 outdoors. Let me tell you what our thinking was there. That's up from 10 indoors and 25 outdoors under current structure. First of all, when it comes to uh, these social gatherings, you're more likely to be um, interfacing with people closer, maybe drinking, less likely to have a mask. That's on the negative side. On the positive, they tend to be invitation only, or you know everybody who's going to be there. So if there was a flare-up, if somebody was found to be infected, track and trace is a lot easier to manage. So we thought this was an appropriate place for um, our inside um, private gatherings to be and our outside private gatherings. So that, that's a big change. Um, maybe New Jersey is a little more ambitious on that front. Uh, you know, Massachusetts and... Um, uh, New York, Rhode Island, sort of comparable to where we are in that space. Um, July 3rd, we're going to add on a few other uh, metrics. Um, as you know, for graduations, we're keeping that at 150. Uh, that's probably July 6th. I don't think he'd be doing that July 3rd. And uh, Deirdre and David have been working on this. Of course, it depends on your cohort. So if you have a group of 150 over here, and you have a group of 150 in another part of the football field, you have some room there to maneuver. But that's uh, what it is for outdoor, uh, outdoor graduations. We're also thinking about big organized outdoor events. We have something called July 4th coming up, and the fireworks. and. Um, Believe me, we've had good, uh, vigorous discussions about what is a safe way to deal with the way that we uh, celebrate our nation's independence and do it in a way that uh, doesn't promote uh, the infections. And we're learning from what we've done at the beaches and uh, the parks, um, limiting parking a little bit, but more importantly, um, keep your social group 15 feet from other people. That's the way it's working on the beaches. Put your blanket down, watch the fireworks, stay with the group that you've been um, you know, hanging out with for a while, you know they're safe, they're like your family, and keep space 15 feet amongst those around you. I think that's a way that we can maintain um, our social distance and be able to enjoy the fireworks in a real way. And we're going to work with the organizers in terms of capping the overall group at, say, 500. So we just don't have a big mass gathering there. Uh, because we're not sure who, um, if it comes to track and trace, we're going to have a better idea of who you were in contact with. That's what we're doing for the outdoor organized gatherings. Then we have event venues, amphitheaters, racetracks, and this such. And there, they're opening as well at 25% capacity, just like we're doing at um, museums and other facilities. And finally, we had a d discussion, frankly, about... Um, what should we project about going forward a month or two from now? And uh, you see how the world has changed in the last month. Um, you can make a case. Why do we project anything at all? It, it maybe leads to a false confidence. Or you could have a flare-up like you've seen in a lot of those red states. Why do we want to give people an idea of what it looks like? Well, so you can plan. So you can have some idea of how we're thinking about events going forward. So you can plan accordingly, comma, uh, be wary, because uh, if the metrics change, if hospitalizations scoot up, if we have these flare-ups, we'll have to, uh, you know, change course. I, that's just reality. But so what we are thinking about is, um, you know, going forward in mid-July, we'd have bigger outdoor gatherings, uh, say 250. Uh, and, and again, following the same social distancing protocols. And that gives you some indication about a uh, private gatherings as well, like a, like a wedding and the such. So those are things that um, you can plan accordingly, knowing that there's a fair amount of risk. You know, um, 
You know, sadly, my daughter Emily uh, postponed her wedding just because uh, she had too many friends that said, um, look, there's a good chance you're going to have this wedding, and I'm really positive about what's going on in places like Connecticut, but there's also a good chance it may not, and we've got to make a, a deposit on the plane and the such. So we're, we're holding off. But I wanted you to get the best idea of how we're thinking about these outside gatherings and what type of progress we're making together, you know, assuming the metrics keep going and we maintain our social distancing. You know, with that, um, Deirdre and David, you can add something or maybe we just take some questions from people. I think it's questions. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Channel 3 Eyewitness News, unmute. The question is about the DMV. Residents are asking us about priorities waiting for the DMV to open so they can get their licensing. Uh, while the nail salons and amusement parks are opening up, is the DMV ready? Customers and agents are sharing the same space. Is the ventilation upgraded? Is the airflow improved? Those are the questions people are asking us. Well, I, I can start on that, and then maybe David could help me out or anybody. Um, Weathersfield, Cheshire, we are opening those up by appointment only. We have a backlog of people who are waiting for their driver's test. We're working with some private contractors to see if we might be able to, um, you know, answer some of that load, obviously uh, wearing the mask accordingly. And finally, for DMV, as you know, we delayed uh, the um, time that you have to renew your license and other things that maybe we're going to take you into DMV just so we could prevent against a rush to DMV, but they are opening. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add that uh, DMV is working on uh, bringing additional services online next week, um, so starting to phase back in uh, road tests. Uh, the knowledge tests have been continuing in a more limited fashion, but they're also working on some creative approaches for how we clear the substantial backlog of, uh, of testing that has built up over the last three months, so the team's working hard on that. A lot of the services are online and are available now. If you have questions, go on the website, um, and you'll start to see even more um, uh, services uh, coming online next week with all the same protocols that we're implementing uh, based on public health and occupational safety guidelines. You'll see a lot of plexiglass in there. You'll see a lot of markings on the floor with one-way traffic and spacing and all the, all the things that I think people are getting used to at this point. Thank you. I'll add as well, this is uh, one of the things that DMV under the leadership of Commissioner Magibani is know before you go and this is the perfect example during this time to know before you go. Go to the website, call ahead, have an understanding of what are the services you need to be done, uh, but also know that uh, other providers who are DMV partners, uh, whether it's the Connecticut uh, Credit Unions, uh, as well as AAA are providing services uh, as well. Thank you. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, Governor. Last night, the Windsor Town Council approved a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. I was just wondering your thoughts, if you'd had any discussions with Senator Anwar about his ask to have a state declaration. Well, um, I'm happy to have that discussion. Not sure what a state declaration means, if I can issue a lot of new executive orders, but I do know that um, this pandemic has, has revealed the racial disparities. And uh, I think we knew this before, and it's really brought it home. The fact that if you're a black, you're twice as likely to die, uh, much more likely to die, much more likely to be infected, uh, comorbidities. And this has just reminded us how we have to um, deal head on with um, the racial disparities as well as the health care crisis we have. And with hotel workers in the state, uh, deli they delivered to you a petition asking to strengthen health and safety guidelines for the hotel and lodging sector, including like mandating hazard pay for them. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we work closely with the uh, hotels as well as uh, labor to make sure that um, A, workers felt safe going back to the hotels. We set very clear protocols in terms of what they have to do in terms of uh, infection standards and the such. And like it is with all of our businesses, it's really important the hotels maintain those standards to give confidence to customers so they're willing to go back as well. Do you have a number of the businesses that have self-certified? And if they don't self-certify and open back up, what the consequence of that is? David? 
Sure, I'm happy to take that. Yeah, so to date, over 15,000, 15,000 businesses have self-certified. You know, we estimate between 30 and 40,000 businesses shut down during the pandemic. So we'd expect to see more as we enter phase two. What we saw in phase one is not all businesses are going to open on the 17th tomorrow. So we expect it to happen over the coming weeks. And then my last question, there is a West Hartford salon asking customers to sign a waiver, basically that they won't get sued if the customer gets COVID-19. Are there any protections for businesses that you're considering enacting? I believe the Reopen Connecticut Committee had made a similar suggestion much earlier on. I don't think so. We've set very clear protocols in terms of how a nail salon, hair salon, restaurant have to meet those protocols. I think that provides them a certain amount of um, you know, protection, but just a certain amount. Um, we've been careful on that. I noticed to go to a Donald Trump rally, you have to sign a waiver as well. So um, people are trying to avoid the risk. But I think most importantly, because David came up with a clear set of protocols, if any employee, any customer feels uncomfortable, doesn't think they're being followed, there's a 211 hotline. You can go report it. We'll be able to respond immediately as well. I think those are the protections you need. News 8. Hi, Governor. Stephanie Simone here. I had a question about the fact that the state is hiring an outside firm to investigate nursing homes and how the Department of Public Health responded to this pandemic. Um, what kind of violations could facilities see if they are in violation? Um, could staff be punished if they, if they didn't follow proper protocol? Well, I'll start on that, but um, and we, we just did an event about the nursing homes with the bipartisan women's caucus from the legislature, very helpful. And uh, you're right, um, we were uh, early on in the um, nursing homes, as you know, in terms of stopping visitations, inspecting all of them. Now we've got a third party that's going to specialize in this, respond to our request, go to each and every one of these nursing homes, want to see why there was such a differential. Some had zero um, infections, some had very, very, very high infection rates and fatalities. Um, what were the moving metrics there? We want to make sure that we get it right if there is a second surge going forward. We want to think long term about uh, our nursing homes. Are there penalties and consequences? Absolutely. Some of these nursing homes have been fined already, and they operate uh, under regulation of a Department of uh, Public Health. So we'll be watching this carefully. That was it. We just, we have to stop since. Oh, um, also, when could we see results of the investigation? How quickly? Do you know that, Jeff? Yeah, the plan is to uh, receive interim uh, recommendations and feedback by uh, mid-August with a target of a final report by the end of September. If everyone could please mute your devices if you're not asking a question. Please mute your devices if you are not asking a question. Thank you. Next to Fox 61. And uh, this question is for Commissioner Lehman about social clubs. We've had a couple of viewers write in about where they fall, obviously, in phase two, but are wondering if social clubs also host weddings, are they allowed to follow the recommendations and the guidelines of, you know, social distancing, reduced capacity, and holding weddings at those different venues? Thank you for the question. So um, the, the short answer is for weddings, that type of gathering is going to have unique uh, guidelines to it. And, and we are expanding and increasing the capacity there. But for that type of event, um, that, that's going to have a significant or excuse me, a specific capacity restriction, which is separate from, for example, the restaurant or the pool guidelines that we have out for social clubs. Um, just as the governor mentioned at the outset, the nature of that event and the commingling and what we view as, as the risk of transmission at that, that event is different. So for social clubs that are doing their normal course business, um, they'll follow restaurant guidelines again and pool guidelines. Um, but for specific outdoor events, they will need to be subject to that, those caps and the outdoor event guidance that we provided. And that would be the same for social clubs who act primarily as bars? So social clubs, again, if, if, if it's primarily a bar or if it is a bar, that's not able to be open until phase three. Um, offering a, a dining uh, experience and food with the alcohol has, has been something that we've felt strongly about as we've opened up these, um, these types of institutions. 
So for, for social clubs that fit that bill, um, they should be able to open in phase three if it's a bar, but phase two um, if, it, if it effectively serves as a broad social club with other activities as well. And Governor, a quick question for you too. We have so many people that are flocking to Connecticut's beaches now that the weather is nice and warm. Do you know when the bathrooms will be open at the beaches? We're getting a lot of questions about restrooms. Now, aren't they? Aren't we opening those up now? Let me get back to you on that. I think it's overdue. Thank you. News 12 Connecticut. News 12, WTIC 1080 News. Connecticut Public Media. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, Governor, uh, I was wondering if you and your team there could share um, what businesses or aspects of this latest op reopening phase uh, give you the cause for, for most concern. Where where are you worried? Um, yeah, what, what, what might worry? Why would you stick with that? Well, early on, I can tell you I was um, worried about indoor, indoor dining. Your mask is off. You're in fairly close quarters. You're indoors, which is riskier than outdoors. I worried about uh, folks uh, coming in from out of state where perhaps their dining wasn't open. Um, a lot less worried about that now for the reasons that we um, learned from outdoor dining, given the fact that the infection rate of our neighbors is much less. I had worried about the hotels and attracting a lot of people from uh, out of state and that back and forth. But again, given the uh, reasonably consistent low infection rate throughout our whole region, um, I feel pretty confident on those two. Those are the two I thought most about going back a few weeks. Yeah, Governor, if I could just add one comment here. One of the things I think is really important in terms of what, what uh, you know, if anything keeps me up at night, it's broadly the culture of compliance that I think we need to uh, keep making sure that we have here in Connecticut. I think it's one of the reasons that we've done so well and our metrics are so, so strong to date. But as we enter in phase two, um, make no mistake about it, we need to keep doing all the mitigation measures that are out there. So specifically, mask wearing is critically important. We need to keep doing that as we reopen the economy. Otherwise, we're gonna jeopardize our reopen. Hand hygiene, whether it's sanitizer or hand washing is critically important. And then lastly, physically distancing. So my, my concern is that people see the data and they think that um, we're back to normal, but we're not. Um, it's important that we reopen the economy, but we can't let our guard down as it relates to these mitigation measures. Otherwise, we will jeopardize our reopening and we don't want to go back to where we were in March and April. So we need to make sure that we do that across all the businesses that are opening here tomorrow. And uh, I guess in, in follow up on the, uh, an earlier question, we've got a reader question asking us when our picnic table is going to be back at state parks. I hear a deafening silence, so Katie Dykes will get right back to you on that. <laughs> okay, um, then could I uh, ask you to uh, respond to a uh, lawsuit that was recently filed by a group of uh, five small business owners and uh, State Senator uh, Rob Sampson that uh, uh, basically challenges the constitutionality of uh, designate your powers to designate businesses as essential or non-essential for the purposes of uh, remaining open to the public during a public health emergency? Whew. Well, I didn't know about a, another lawsuit, but um, look, the legislature on a really strong bipartisan basis uh, uh, gave me some uh, executive powers given the fact that uh, COVID was crashing on us like a wave. And we had to move quickly, we had to move expeditiously. Uh, we worked, our team worked, Paul in particular, briefing the uh, legislator, at least the legislative leadership on a regular basis going forward. We tried to limit um, what we did in terms of health care, COVID health, our COVID health response. What we did in terms of, um, you know, 
businesses opening and closing. By the way, I should remind you, almost all of them had closed before we had to close the last ones. Everything we did with an eye on limiting the spread of COVID. Uh, these executive powers that the legislative granted me um, will be done in about you know September, I think. And um, legislature's coming in, so I'll have a chance to talk to them again. And uh, we just have another uh, reader question. Uh, uh, had this one before. Uh, when do you expect state offices to sort of reopen to the public in a, for more in-person uh, business or uh, <laughs> remote? Want that? Sure. So we're, we're following with our state operations the same protocols we put out for uh, private businesses, which starts with if you're able to work from home, um, that's still the preferred option. We'd, we'd like to keep the risk as low as possible through telecommuting, um, and we've enabled a substantial amount of telecommuting over the last several months. Um, where there are um, citizen or, or, or resident-facing services that have been discontinued, each of our agencies is working through a reopen plan on how to do that. There's a lot of online services that are all available. Uh, they're all communicating via their respective websites. And we will see more people coming into the office slowly, but again, we want to keep that only to really activities that are required to be done in person and try to, again, keep the, the physical distancing, telecommuting as much as possible. Okay, thank you very much. The Hartford Current. Hey, this is Emily Brindley from the Hartford Current. Um, Governor, given the rising numbers of cases in other states, as you talked about a few minutes ago, do you have any concerns about out-of-state travel, either people coming in from other states or Connecticut residents going somewhere else and then returning? I think we, we watch this carefully. If um, you're feeling ill, you're feeling you're symptomatic, you're coming in from uh, out of state or you're, you're returning home, obviously you stay home and you self-quarantine. I think that's uh, really important. Um, you know, some of the governors are telling people to automatically self-quarantine. Um, I don't think we're there at this point. But I do look at some of these other states right now. Some of them are hot zones. Some of them have a 20% infection rate. So we are going to uh, pay special attention to it, but not yet in terms of any uh, mandatory changes. And then in terms of just kind of in general protecting the state's COVID progress, what other resident behaviors are you keeping an eye on? Like what are, what are the potential triggers that you're worried about that could kind of roll back the state's progress on this? I think our reopening strategy has been cautious and appropriate. You know, what do I worry about? I worry about, um, you know, thousands of people at protests or people getting casual on the beach and uh, not um, wearing their mask or um, uh, hundreds of seniors at a gambling casino and uh, they're um, having a Coca-Cola and they're um, not wearing their mask. I worry about some potential hot spots there. I worry about the congested neighborhoods, those that are more densely packed, where Josh is making such an extra effort to make sure people get tested. I think broadly speaking, um, we're doing very well in terms of uh, community spread and holding down. But what I worry about as I look around uh, other states is the possibility of these flare-ups. If you don't control that with track and trace, they can spread quickly. Thank you. Hearst Connecticut Media. It's Caitlin Krasholtz. Can you hear me? Sort of, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hi. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. The first is um, regarding the masks. Um, you know, as the data continues to improve, at least comparative to the peak and compared to other states, and as the state reopens, um, we've seen kind of anecdotally that people maybe are getting lax about that. I know that you've launched a marketing campaign to encourage mask wearing, but are you considering... Um, increasing any sort of enforcement. I know there's a, a no mask day planned for this weekend. Um, so will you be stepping up enforcement regarding mask wearing? No, I don't think so. Um, I, what, what I've noticed, especially talking to my fellow governors, is Connecticut's been pretty good about wearing the mask. They're using their judgment. Uh, if you're in a park, you're not near somebody, um, that's different. If you're inside, you're in a store, uh, you have to wear it. That's what the rules are. And um, if we find people are getting more and more lax, as we've seen in some other states, uh, we'll take a second look. So far, so good. Great. And um, the Police Chiefs Association uh, placed a 90-day moratorium on purchasing surplus military equipment. Um, do you have a response to that? 90 days, you know, isn't that long. What happens in 91 days? 
I, I think that that is sort of my response. Um, you know, here at the state level with the state police, uh, we have an indefinite pause. And the legislature, when they get back together, they're going to be coming up with some rules of the road that will impact the uh, uh, local and municipal police. I don't think they need this military-style equipment, so I hope their pause is uh, a lot longer than 90 days. The Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, I wanted to ask you about the, the prospect of a special session. I know you've said that you're open to talking, uh, having it deal with issues of police accountability and absentee ballots. But I'm, I'm curious if you're concerned about if the agenda expands too much, because you have a large um, pandemic-induced budget deficit to deal with after July 1st. And I'm curious, quite frankly, if you think that it has the potential to get even worse if we start launching programs that we probably can't afford. Well, Paul Mounds is leading the discussion with the legislative leadership, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. I think there's a general consensus about what we want to accomplish in a shortened session in the middle of, um, you know, COVID. Uh, with two things we really have to work towards. One, police accountability. We've discussed that a fair amount in terms of what we'd like to accomplish with a special session. We haven't spent quite as much time talking about uh, making it easier to vote, uh, absentee ballots, voting by mail. Again, a COVID-related uh, event because we don't want seniors waiting in long lines uh, to vote. We saw what happened in Georgia. So I think uh, that's what Paul is focused on with legislative leadership. I think that should be the focus of a very short uh, special session. We'll have plenty of time to think about bigger issues with more public hearings um, that deserve the attention uh, later on this year. Would you agree, Governor, that you can probably do police accountability and absentee ballots, though, without a sizable fiscal impact? Um, and I guess I'm asking if there are any other proposals that do have a, a significant fiscal impact. Um, for your mind, do those have to wait until the 2021 session? I think that's right, Keith. Uh, nothing that I have seen is uh, fooling around with the budget. You know, as you know better than anybody else, we're right up close to a spending cap. Uh, but I think what we've got on the plate right now in terms of accountability and voting will not have a fiscal impact, and we can get that done soon. Thank you. The Associated Press. Thanks, Max. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, in light of the pandemic, there's been uh, sort of a renewed interest among some families to resurrect legislation that would allow nursing home residents and their families to have cameras, electronic monitoring devices inside the rooms of the residents. I wondered how you thought about that, and perhaps um, the commissioner could weigh in as well. Yeah, I know Deirdre um, issued some guidelines in terms of how we can start um, being able to get back in personal contact uh, with our loved ones. Um, it's really important, um, and they've been socially isolated for a long time, doing some things outdoors, doing some things in terms of testing with a fever, uh, in terms of making it appropriate. I was talking to Vanessa Durantes uh, from the Department of Children and Families, and they're doing a lot with FaceTime. And, uh, you know, they used to have to do uh, visits um, every day to visit, um, you know, folks who are in foster care. And they're finding uh, with the FaceTime, they're able to be very effective, cover a lot of uh, space. But I don't think that covers for a loved one at a, a nursing home. Deirdre? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we certainly understand the, um, the frustration that families are feeling when they're not able to visit their loved ones in nursing facilities. Um, the, and we have been, as the governor alluded to, working with the industry very closely on implementing, for example, the ability to have outdoor visits, um, socially distanced outdoor visits with loved ones, and making sure that that option is being offered consistently to families. And as the governor mentioned, the type of electronic visits. And uh, CDC and CMS have issued some guidance around beginning to reopen nursing facilities to visitation. Obviously, we want to be very, very careful, as this was the segment of our healthcare industry that was obviously the most hard hit by COVID. We want to be very, very careful while acknowledging and respecting uh, the understandable need for families and loved ones to see one another again. 
We are um, uh, implementing a testing strategy in our nursing facility, so we'll be able to know when a facility is has been COVID free for a period of time. And that will certainly help us with some safety measures. So we're taking it slowly uh, while also balancing the needs of families and residents in the nursing homes. Uh, thank you for that. But this legislation is really more about having electronic monitoring in there. They, they are concerned. It's not just FaceTime. They want to be able to have access to see what's going on in those rooms 24-7. Yeah, that's a complicated question. There are obviously, um, you know, some potential upsides to that and also some potential downsides in terms of privacy, et cetera. I know other states have looked at this and it's been a question that's been grappled with. So uh, it's, a, it's a complicated issue that, uh, you know, merits a lot of discussion before we would put something like that into place. And on a, another subject, uh, Governor, I'm a loyal user of the How We Feel app, <laughs> and I've noticed uh, there's been a drop off some days in the participation. And I know that your administration had hoped to use technology to keep track of the pandemic I, I, and try to watch out for hot spots. I wondered, you know, is COVID fatigue something you're concerned about and you won't be able to rely on that information from the app or any other of these types of technologies to keep track of where COVID stands? Yes, uh, so that's a really good question. You're right, we ramped up to something like 75,000 users on how we feel. It gave us a little bit of a crystal ball, what's going on in Eastern Connecticut versus the Northwest. And we could see some differences there. And some, as you point out, usage is slipping a little bit. But I hope it doesn't mean people aren't paying attention to COVID because um, it's really important that we maintain our, um, protect our guard, keep up our guard. But there are other ways that we're monitoring. I'm sorry, Commissioner Tintero. Governor, could I add something there? Um, so what, what I'd like to, uh, to your question about is there, are there other things we can do? Um, and the answer to that is uh, the things that Commissioner Lehman emphasized, which is not let down our guard on the mask wearing and the social distancing. It's, it's hard to overemphasize that. To protect our economy as well as protect our health, um, we, we need to keep up with the mask wearing, even when we're going to these outside events. And um, wear the mask when you're leaving and, and entering, and then if you're seated for a while far away from everyone, you can take it off. But in addition to that, I really want to um, impress on everyone the importance of getting tested if you have any symptoms at all of COVID-19. The beginning of this pandemic when across the country testing was not easily available, um, there was uh, an emphasis on testing those who were uh, on the sicker end of the spectrum. We're not in that position now. And so to your point about early signals, um, if we, everyone who has a symptom of COVID, whether that's a sore throat, a cough, a loss of taste or smell, even nausea or vomiting, shortness of breath, um, and in particular, if you have an underlying health condition like hypertension or diabetes, if everyone who has a symptom of COVID gets tested early on at the first sign, that will really help us understand if we're starting to see an uptick in cases. And, and testing is widely available for everyone who has any symptom at all. So I would encourage the public to take advantage of that. Thank you very much. You're the, welcome. The Day of New London. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, here in New London, we have a number of ferries, and I wondered if you could address what safety protocols and restrictions are in place for ferries, particularly as more people start taking them, um, such as any restrictions on percentage of capacity, social distancing, mask wearing, and concession stands. I'm, I'm happy to take this one, Governor, if you'd like. Yeah, so for, for ferries, uh, broadly, um, there are restrictions, and it's similar to what we're doing for other uh, businesses. So there is reduced capacity. Um, there is a requirement to ensure that there's spacing, whether it's uh, standing by rail length or by seating. Uh, there is frequent cleaning of common touch points. Uh, and I believe we are asking, I don't need to confirm this, but if there are amenities like a, a snack bar, that those amenities are closed. But I'll, I'll confirm that last point. But it's similar to what we're asking for other uh, like businesses. Uh, again, mask wearing, cleaning, reduced capacity, uh, and making sure that people really embrace all of that as they use the ferry. Thank you, and sorry, could I ask uh, what the reduced capacity is? I believe it's 50% for ferries. 
again, but there's there's typically a limitation to ensure that there is adequate distancing uh, by a rail length as well. But 50% is the guideline that we're providing. Thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. My uh, first question is for Commissioner Gifford. Um, I wanted to know, the nursing homes say that they have been reporting recovery data, um, and this information has been reported to the state. Um, is there any any ability to share that um, publicly, or um, is this information that will be reported in the future? Uh, you're asking about the number of individuals who had COVID and have since recovered? Correct. Yeah. Um, it, it can be a little tricky to calculate that, um, but we are certainly looking at um, continuing to evolve and expand our nursing home reporting. Um, and because as we've begun to do the broad testing of both residents and staff, um, we want to make sure that we are both aligning with the national requirements for reporting and making sure that we're giving consistent information about any changes in status. So uh, we'll get back to you in terms of whether there would be a public report on specifically number of individuals who have recovered, but you're likely to see our nursing home reporting evolve over the next uh, weeks or so as we switch from uh, a more, uh, the uh, intensity of the pandemic to a more steady state in nursing homes. Okay. Um, and uh, Governor, I have a question about uh, early in March, you granted uh, nursing homes and, and hospitals uh, immunity, um, you know, for, from, you know, malpractice lawsuits um, related to COVID. Is there a chance that you might do another executive order to um, shorten uh, or, or give them back um, the ability to to sue these providers before the September, um, before your orders are up in September? Yeah, Christine, I think that's um, something we think about. I mean, remember, um, gross negligence, uh, you're still liable. Uh, you can be fined. Uh, we, we regulate you in terms of uh, your licensing if you can stay in. So there's still plenty of sanctions if you're not getting the job done in a totally appropriate way. Uh, we did um, provide some liability protection early on just because we had a lot of COVID patients. We we're moving them around. It was new. We we're trying to uh, get the nursing homes to make sure they could have COVID only facilities. We're in a different environment now, so we'll take a look at that. Um, thank you. Bosecto Media. All right, I'm getting the signal. Um, one more thought on George Floyd. We've talked about this uh, a fair amount, but something um, you know our administration has tried to do from the very beginning is make sure we have uh, a team that reflects the amazing diversity of our state. And I think that's more important now than it? ever when it comes to uh, law enforcement. And um, what I wanted to do is uh, give you an idea of why we've been able to double the number of people who are not white males who are now uh, coming to serve in our state police. If I can do this in our municipal police, we can do that with judges, we can do that with teachers. What a better state we would be. And this is uh, the recruit we've done that has attracted a lot of folks who might find being a state policeman is not a bad place to make a difference. Policing in America is transforming. Technology, innovation, and hard lessons learned from history have changed how we serve our communities. As we embrace a new generation of policing, we seek the next generation of law enforcement officer. We seek those who will do what's right and stick to their values. We seek those eager to build trust and break down barriers. We seek those who are willing to encounter difficult situations and put the well-being of our strangers above their own. We seek those who are determined to make our state a safer place for our families. We are seeking you, the next generation of Connecticut State Trooper. Every day we're trying to do a little bit better. Thank you, everybody.